Hi, I'm Jill Criswell. I am the author of Beasts of the Frozen Sun. And today, um, to go along with my presentation that I did um, from Westeros to Hogwarts, from Hogwarts to Westeros, um, I'm also going to be doing a Q&A session uh, virtually. So some of you uh, sent in questions that you had for me to answer. I'm going to answer those um, as quickly as I can, but but trying to also give you guys some some advice uh, in your own writing because that was one of the um, one of the most common types of questions that I got. So let me open up. Okay, so Q&A. So first question, <laughs> what's your Harry Potter house? Uh, I am a Ravenclaw through and through. They are uh, all about the work ethic and that really resonates with me. So um, when I took my quiz, I got like 95% Ravenclaw. So that's my Harry Potter house. When will we get the sequel to Beasts of the Frozen Sun? It comes out in just a few months, September 22nd. Um, that's when that will be available. So be on the lookout for that if you're interested. What was the inspiration for Beasts of the Frozen Sun? So my travels to Iceland were where I got the idea for creating this sort of Viking inspired, Celt inspired world, um, and specifically going to the Saga Museum and seeing this uh, exhibit about uh, Melkorka Mirkjartan's daughter. So I talk more about that in the other presentation if you want more on that, but, but really where lots of my inspiration comes for writing is the traveling that I've done. The hardest scene or chapter to write in Beasts of the Frozen Sun? This is not a very interesting answer, but I hate traveling scenes. I hate it when my characters have to leave a place and then it's going to take them several days until they get to where they're going and I have to write all these, you know, we're traveling, we're on our horses, we're looking at landscapes, and I'm like struggling to make it interesting. I really want to just have my characters be there. Um, so that was a thing that I struggled with in the book, was coming up with, okay, if they're traveling, what kind of interesting things can they see? What kind of things can they be thinking about? Can I throw in some action? Uh, and so hopefully those scenes <laughs> wound up being more interesting in the book than they were for me as I struggled to write them. What's your favorite fantasy world? So there are a lot and it like depends on if you mean what was my favorite to read or what world would I most want to live in. Um, I decided to just go with Westeros because who doesn't want to ride dragons? Um, so, I went with Game of Thrones because it's the most commonly known, but, but really, um, The Last Namsara or uh, Fireborn or anything like that where people get to ride dragons, that's a world I would want to live in. Um, what's the last book you read that really impressed you with its world building? Again, so, so many that I could talk about. But two of my favorites that I always go back to as I'm writing my own books are Rebel of the Sands um, and An Ember in the Ashes, just because the, the stories are so good and the worlds are so good and feel so unique. And I'm going to come back to these books as I start talking about um, writing advice in some of the later questions. When planning a story, what comes first? The plot, the characters, or the world? Any and all of them. It just depends on who you are and where you get your inspiration from. For me, the idea for a new book almost always starts with an image. So for Beasts of the Frozen Sun, I had this image 
of a Celtic girl standing on a shore in Ireland um, watching these Viking ships come ashore and just being terrified and awed. And so um, that image grew into a story and that image actually became the cover of the book. So that's where it started and it, from there the, um, the world building and the other characters and the plot sort of unfolded as I thought and, and thought more about it. But it, it, again, any of them, it just really depends on what inspires you. How detailed should the history of the setting be for a fantasy novel? Um, what kinds of things should be determined about the world building before writing versus thinking of them as you're writing? Um, so again, you can go back to my Hogwarts to Westeros um, presentation to get some more ideas about this, about details you can put in. But um, you want to have some history, you want to have some mythology and religion and government things in your fantasy novel because those are the kinds of things that will help make it unique and will help make it feel like a fully developed world rather than just a book that is all plot. So how much of it should you know before writing versus as you're writing? Again, it, it depends on your writing style. I like to have a pretty good idea of what the world is going to be as I start writing. Um, but things will change and you'll come up with a lot of, a, a lot more stuff as you're writing and you really get to know the world. Um, so yeah, I think have some of that figured out before you start, but also know that as you write, you'll, you'll have more things come up um, by necessity because you'll, you'll need to know, oh, okay, they're traveling to this place. What's happening there? How is it different from the place they just came from? And then you'll have to make that up on the spot. Um, but that will often give you more ideas of other things you can add back in and other things to add later. And um, so, so, yeah, I mean, have some ideas before you get started, but be open to changing those ideas or having a lot of new stuff come up um, as, as you're writing your book. What te techniques do you use to manage a complex plot so that you stay organized and maintain continuity with the world and events? Um, outlines, outlines, outlines. So basic, and you don't have to make notes of every single thing, but basic things you want to keep track of. Who your characters are. So I always keep a sheet that is here are the names of my characters. And one thing that's helpful about that is that you don't want your characters, any of your main characters to have names that sound too similar. So a thing that I often have to do is I have a character name and then I have another character's name and I'm like, oh wait, no, those sound too similar. So I have to change them. And seeing them all next to each other helps me keep that straight. Names of places is the same sort of thing. I've named, I've before named places where, where it was almost the exact same name and then gone, oh wait, I already used a name that sounded really similar to that. So that will help you keep that straight. Timeline, uh, timeline of events. So this, this is more about what day is it? What month is it? What season is it? Is it daytime or nighttime? Um, keeping a list of that as you're going through your book will help you not make those kinds of mistakes. I highly encourage you to make yourself a map of your world, either hand-drawn one, or you can find lots online of, of fantasy map making programs that are either free or don't cost very much. And you can mark your locations, um, make it look however you want it to look. You can have different features on it. But even if, you, whether you do it on a computer or just hand draw it, it's helpful to think about what's different about these places? What sets them apart? Is it the climate? Is it the religion? Is it the landscape? And to just make little notes of that 
that way, as you're moving through your book, <laughs> You, you might get mixed up. I get mixed up sometimes. So going back and going, okay, these characters are in this place. What is this place like again? And I have gotten to the point where I go so far as to look up what are their um, most common natural resources and what are they trading and, you know, what just like really trying to get into the cultures of, um, of the different places to make sure they all feel different from each other. And again, to stay organized, keep a list of it. Um, just You can just have something that you write down on paper or a Word doc where you keep it all straight. But, but yeah, just having something you can open for your own reference is really helpful. What's a good way to really weave the setting and the world into the plot and make it essential to the story? So this is really important. And there's no magic way to do it um i would say number one read other books and see how they do it um but going back to that outline keeping um keeping your details in your head and seeing you know at, can i describe the landscape can i describe the mythology here um, can I have the characters talking about it? Maybe there's a storyteller who is going to talk about it. Maybe there's a song people are uh, singing or a game they're playing or um, artwork is another thing. I like to have architecture and, um, and paintings and statues that sort of reflect the history and the religion of um, the cultures that I'm uh, including in my books. Those are all little ways to add those things in there. Um, and so in Beast of the Frozen Sun, I've got a song, I've got um, scenes of the main character telling the story of her people to, to uh, a foreign character. Um, there are places where people are just having conversations where they talk about, you know, what do you think about this thing? Do you believe these stories? And um, you'll find little ways that you can do that. And so those, those two books I mentioned before, where I like the world building so much, do it beautifully. Um, and, and so these are great books to study or again any any books that you love that are in the fantasy genre look at how they do this so for me when i read a book i kind of read it on two different levels i read it for enjoyment but i'm also on the lookout for things like this and especially if i'm reading a book for the second time i am looking for how they do this sort of thing and I, I buy my own copies of the books I love the most and I mark pages and I go back to them when I need to and I look at, oh, how did they do this? Oh, that's great. I'm going to try and do something like that. So that's a thing that I highly recommend that, that can help you in your own writing as you're trying to find inspiration. Do you just use your imagination when picturing your fantasy world or do you use references like photos of places around the world? So I am lucky enough to have done lots and lots of traveling um, in, in my years. So um, I often seek inspiration from places that I've actually been to and I can go back and look at my photographs of me in those places. So just to give you an example, um, there are, there's a place in Beasts of the Frozen Sun called the Northern Bluffs that I based on the Cliffs of Moher in Ireland. Um, the village, the main village where most of the events take place in the book is called Stony Harbor. And that was based um, partially on a town in Scotland called Uig, which has these stones everywhere and is, you know, very windy and the ocean there is gray and rough. And um, so I was inspired by those places to, um, th th that helped me create the world in my book. 
Um, I do, though, also go back and look at pictures that other people have taken because I'm not a photogra photographer and I haven't explored every inch of every place that I'm writing about. Um, and so, yeah, Google Images is pretty amazing and you can find pictures of just about any place that exists. So that's another thing I make a lot of use of um, as I'm seeking inspiration. So yeah, using pictures that you find online, using photo blogs, that's another thing that can be helpful um, in the sequel to Beast of the Frozen Sun. There is a long journey that takes place through Iseneld, uh, which is based on Iceland, and I found a um, photo blog that um, someone had posted on a website because they had hiked across the center of Iceland, and that was extremely helpful to me, that they were describing it and showing pictures of it, and so I used that. Even though I've been to Iceland, I haven't been to every place there and that was really helpful for for reference so um make use of what you can find on the internet to help you uh find inspirations for the worlds you're building how do you get over writer's block so i love to read for inspiration um and if i don't have a book that i'm reading at the moment that i am really in love with i'll go back to books that I love and read them again for the second, third, fourth time to, to try and get some inspiration and help that will help me move forward in my own book. Write when you're at your most alert. So whether that's early in the morning or late at night or in the middle of the afternoon, if you can do it, if you can get away from school and work and whatever you have going on, um, that's the best time to write because you're going to be at your most uh, your most mentally agile in that moment and 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 that matters. Don't try and let write in the morning if you're not a morning person. Eliminate distractions. So get away from family who's going to be banging on your door, from noisy roommates. Turn your phone off. People get shocked when I say this, but you have to do it. If you want to be able to write and get in the zone and not be pulled out of it, which is a thing that can cause writer's block, uh, you have to get away from everything that distracts you. Find the right music. This is really important for me. If I am listening to music that does not have the right tone for what I'm writing, I have a really hard time getting through the scenes. So a thing that I do a lot is make my own playlists on Spotify and Apple Music so that when I'm ready to write, I can just sit down and hit play and I know I've already got a playlist of a bunch of songs that are going to put me in the mood to write what I'm trying to write. And then brainstorm. Think about it. Give yourself some time. Sleep on it go for a walk and think about it, um, talk it out with a friend if you can, especially someone who is uh, an avid reader or even a fellow writer. And all of those things can help you work through any problems, any um, obstacles that might keep you from pushing through. And then finally, I often struggle to make a story more than simply a protagonist going on a hard journey to stop an antagonist and learning a lesson along the way. What additional elements do you think are a good way to spice up a plot to keep it more interesting for the writer and readers? So again, go back to my Hogwarts to Westeros presentation. I've got um, a writing exercise of here's some de details that you should know. I talk about how you can use history to help you make your fantasy worlds more interesting, more grounded. Pay attention to the plots of other books you love. I've said this before, but I'll say it again and again and again. See what they've done. And you're not going to copy, but you want to take what other people have done and see how can I do it in my own way? How can I put my own spin on it? And then do the unexpected. 
So the going on a journey is a common thing that we see in books, but it doesn't have to be done in exactly the same way. So maybe your characters start on a journey and something happens and they never make it to where they were going or they get to where they were going and it's not what they thought it was going to be. Uh, and this, you know, going back to the um, pay attention to plots of other books you love and going to those other books that I have mentioned earlier, um, Rebel of the Sands has the first, I, I guess the middle part of the book is a journey. Um, the two main characters are going on a journey, but before they get there, disaster strikes, and one of the characters gets badly wounded, and the other character has to stop where she's going and help him, and then that leads them on a completely different trajectory. Um, so the other book I mentioned was um, An Ember in the Ashes, the sequel to that uh, a Torch Against the Night has a journey in it as well, but there's other interesting things going on. So, so um, on the journey, different things happen. One of the characters has been poisoned and keeps having hallucinations, which make it interesting. Um, the two characters wind up splitting up at one point, and so we see we get a split of those storylines. Um, there's a third character who is not on that journey, who is you know somewhere else doing other things, and we get some of her chapters as well to kind of give us a break from the journeying. So think about how can you take that standard journey story and mix it up and do other things with it. And this is the same for other types of, um, of commonly seen fantasy tropes that you might be doing like you know the the chosen one or you know the the competition story um try and look at how it's been done in the past and think about ways you can do it that make it different and unexpected and something we haven't seen before all right so that is my Q&A session. Uh, I hope that was informative um, and that you enjoyed it. Uh, you can always go to my website, jillcriswell.com, and you can send me an email through that. Um, it's got a little contact tab if you have other questions. Um, and I guess that's it. So thank you to Spartanburg County Libraries for facilitating all this.